Welcome out all. Let me see. The camera's not on any of you, so maybe should I like say welcome out all 50 of you? Uh, a couple more showed up. Welcome. There's a handout in the back for you to grab if you want where you first came in. Tonight is session number three. It's February the 15th, 2022. And a lot of what we're going to be talking about tonight and in the weeks to follow, you know, anytime you, you're talking about the subject of eschatology, you're going to be talking a lot about the spirit of this age, the spirit of antichrist, the spirit of evil, the mystery of iniquity, the Bible calls it. And the thing about the mystery of iniquity is it's uh, driven by deception. And I think, uh, you know, I've preached this kind of thing, taught this kind of thing throughout my whole ministry. But with what is going on in Canada right now is, to me, one of the best examples of how uh, the mystery of iniquity can be what Paul describes the uh, ministers of Satan. They, are, they present themselves as ministers of light. And so that's why it's so deceptive. It's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to see them as evil and wicked when they come across so you know, nice, you listen to Trudeau's speech, even the one where he declared emergency powers, very soft-spoken, even-tempered, Mr. Gentleman, dressed to the nines, very formal, and yet you listen to what he says and you try to understand what it means, and it's like the most wicked thing ever. And yet, the masses are deceived because what a nice man. What a well-spoken, intelligent, well-dressed, even-tempered man. How can he be wrong? Uh, so this whole spirit of this age, the final Antichrist will come across as a peacemaker, as a man able to solve very complex problems that no one, no other leader in the world can solve. He's going to come along, say, here's the answer, and everyone's going to say he's right, and the Bible says they're going to give their power and authority to him. He's not even going to have to take it. They're going to give it to him because he's going to come across so brilliant and so uh, clearly with the answers uh, that anyone who resists him is going to seem to be uh, just you know the worst troublemaker. And so it's just so interesting that uh, this uh, raw power, you know, as we say, everything comes down to money and power. You know, really just about does. And uh, but th this kind of raw power. Uh, is going to be on full display by the Antichrist. And even though he comes in peaceably and with smooth language and all the answers, uh, once he has it, he's going to become very brutal. And, you know, the Bible talks about those who resist him are going to have their heads cut off. So to me, just that kind of language is obvious that he's going to be in confederation with a group of Muslim nations against Israel and against Christians, against the church, and uh, those who try to stop him or speak out against him, the death penalty will be a severed head. So that kind of gives us a big clue as to what kind of religion will be involved in it. So we're just, you know, we're seeing this being played out these last three weeks. And uh, it, it's just going to be uh, something very similar. The crisis will be larger. 
So the one with the solution will be uh, considered unstoppable and deserving of, of any kind of power he's given. So we're going to be talking about some of these things tonight. Let's start with prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this opportunity to share your word once again, this very large and complex, complicated subject of eschatology. We're trying to unravel it a little bit at a time. Uh, we don't want to be in a big rush. We don't want to do the usual three or four major subjects and skip over from here to there. We want to just simply go through the New Testament, try to stop for even if it's just for a moment, and make comment on any verse that has to do with uh, the leading up to your return, the end times, the final great clash between good and evil. Pray that you would help me, bless me, give me wisdom, bless the word to our hearts. I pray that it might benefit our lives to be a witness for you to others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's start in the one of the uh, main text verses we started with over in Habakkuk. I just really want to read uh, the one verse I have up there, chapter 2 and verse 3. And especially that statement we closed with last time, uh, an appointed time. Uh, God has a God has a schedule. God has a time clock. God has a calendar that He goes by. Uh, the holy feast days are very much have to do with the first and second coming of Christ and the time in between. And so, ch chapter two and verse three says, "For the vision is yet for an appointed time." Well, who made the appointment? Of course, it was God. And it's going to happen exactly uh, when and the way he de has determined. But at the end, it will speak and it will not lie, as opposed to the Antichrist, who will be full of lies. Uh, though it tarries, we're going to talk some about that tonight, because it has tarried, hasn't it? It's tarried for a long time. It's tarried for... Uh, 6,000 years, because the first prophecies were way back in the beginning of Genesis. Uh, Though it tarries, wait for it. So there's the endurance, the patience, the perseverance that the Bible, you know, watch and pray and all those kind of verses. Uh, be patient about it, because it will surely come, because the one who made the appointment is faithful and capable to bring it about. It's as sure as anything. It will not tarry. In other words, at the time the appointment is supposed to come to pass, it will happen quickly. And so, you know, things are going along now, and things are really weird recently in the last two years. But it just shows us how history uh, is not just a steady flow of advancements and battles and nations being formed and empires rising and falling over hundreds or thousands of years. Uh, mostly history changes by major events, either natural disasters or a turn in a major battle to where the side that ends up winning. Welcome, come on in. Hi. Hi, come on in. Hey, how you guys Welcome to our Bible study. We're just getting started, so you, you haven't missed a lot. This uh, appointed time of Habakkuk 2 3, in New Testament language, it's uh, usually stated in due time. And Romans 5, 6 says that Christ died for us in due time, died for the ungodly. When did Christ die? He died at Passover on the exact year that God had determined so that there would be the correct number of days 
from Passover for three days and nights to go by for him to be raised on Sunday morning from the grave. And so God had that all worked out ahead of time, and Christ died exactly when he should have died. Uh, they thought they were manipulating things with their trials, with their plottings and schemings. But it's uh, really interesting all through the Gospel of John, uh, it, it says several different times they tried to arrest him or they tried to capture him. They tried even wanted to put him to death a few times uh, ahead of the cross. And the Bible just simply says it wasn't his hour yet. Uh, so they couldn't do it. Uh, they weren't any different. They didn't have any more or less power when they finally did arrest him and kill him. They were the same people, but, but they could not accomplish it until God said, it's time. And only then could they, could they do it. And Galatians 4.4 uses the term fullness of time. In the fullness of time, meaning when, when the time became full, according to God's calendar, uh, Christ was born of a woman, born under the law. So he was born exactly at the right time. Now, 1 Timothy 2.6 says that in due time, he gave himself for us, a ransom for us. So it's just a little different way of saying exactly what Habakkuk 2.3 says, an appointed time. Very often in the book of Daniel, it talks about appointed times for the prophecies to come to pass. So we're going to talk a little bit about time tonight. But before we do that, uh, we're going to start in the book of Matthew. And this is actually, even though this is our third session... This will be the first verse of our sequential order that we're going to go through. So uh, the last or the first two sessions were mainly introductory material. So if you turn to Matthew chapter 2, I have it there in the middle of the whiteboard. And before we actually read it and go over to the book of Micah, where it is quoted from, I want to look at the, this group of verses on the left, uh, and I'm not even including all of them, but this is representative of a longer list. And we're only going to read some of them, not all of them tonight. But just for your benefit, if you want to take a picture of the board or write down the verses. Uh, but these are a group of verses in the New Testament where it clearly says that they are using passages from the Old Testament prophets as a basis for what they're saying in the New Testament. And, you know, if you think about it, uh, the New Testament apostles and other preachers and the writers of the books, before the books were written, and before they were brought together into what we call the New Testament, uh, the Old Testament was the Bible of their day. And yet you look into the early chapters of uh, Acts, and they would grab hold of those Old Testament passages from some what, what are called minor prophets or the major prophets, and they would preach the most powerful sermon, a gospel sermon, about the death, burial, and Christ uh, by picking a passage in Joel, like Peter did on the day of Pentecost. He quoted Joel chapter 2. And that was his text for his whole message. Uh, and you go through Acts, and that's what they did, because that was the only Bible they had. And yet, they did not have a lack of material to draw from. We just, we, we've, we've allowed ourselves in our day to think if you're really going to preach about Christ and a gospel message and you want people to hear it and be saved and to give their lives to the Lord, that, that you must stay in the New Testament to do it. But they didn't have the New Testament, and they didn't have a problem having plenty of material to preach gospel messages. So really, the New Testament is kind of uh, 
an expansion or a further explanation of what the prophets were speaking about in the Old Testament. It's not like brand new material. In fact, most of the terminology, the phrasing, the, the words that they use in the New Testament uh, passages, especially about prophecy, they're plucking those directly from the Old Testament prophets and maybe building around it, but the, the terminology is exactly the same. So let's look at Luke 24. There's one that we'll read. We'll come back to Matthew 2. But Luke 24, this is right after the resurrection of Christ. And uh, he meets up with these two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And he's walking with them, and he's asking them to relate to him the story of what had happened three days earlier. So that's just really, I've always kind of gotten some, some humor out of that. They said to him, are you the only stranger? Don't you know what's happened in the last three days? And, of course, he was not a stranger at all. He was, he was the one that happened to. But he wanted them to tell him what had happened to him. Just really kind of funny to me. And they did a pretty good job, but uh, they didn't really understand all the implications of it. So he said in verse 25 of Luke 24, Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart. Have you ever been slow of heart? I have. Slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. That's probably the biggest reason there's so much about the Bible we don't understand, isn't it? It's not because we haven't read it, not because we haven't really studied it, but we're slow of heart to really understand it. And these were disciples. So even disciples can be very slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Verse 26, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Wouldn't you have liked to have heard that sermon? How he went back, starting in Genesis, and went all the way through Malachi and said, this is me, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me. Now, they probably knew some of those were about their Messiah. But can you imagine? Oh, we didn't realize that. Oh, you're right. That, is, that was you. Uh, and so I don't know how long this sermon lasted because there's a lot of references to Christ in the Old Testament. So he may have done like a, just a summary of it. I don't know. But Moses and all the prophets all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So what is a good definition of the Old Testament? The things concerning Christ. It's not just the New Testament. Down to verse 44, he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled. Must be. Because God had determined it, you know, at a point of time had to be worked out. That all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. So this is the verse where we get the three main divisions of the Old Testament is the law, the first five books of Moses, the Torah, the prophets, and then all the Psalm kind of books. Uh, and that's a good way of describing the entire Old Testament. Then I think I'll skip over to uh, Acts 26. And you can read the others on your own. They, they're all saying kind of the same thing, that the Old Testament is full of truth about Christ. Acts 26, uh, verse 22, Paul is uh, giving his defense uh, before, well, different groups, three or four different groups here in these chapters. King Agrippa here, uh, 
Verse 22, therefore, having obtained help from God to this day, I stand witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come. No other things. Plenty of information. But, but what did the prophets and Moses say would come? Verse 23, that the Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead, would proclaim light to the Jewish people, and to the Gentiles. So, interesting. The way we look at the Old Testament and the way the New Testament writers describe the Old Testament is very different. In chapter 28 and 23, Paul is in Rome. He's in uh, house arrest. And he says in verse 23, So when they had appointed him a day, many came to him at his lodging, to whom he explained and solemnly te testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning to evening. So, you know, we have this Bible study for an hour. Evidently, this was, what, eight to ten hours of Paul simply going through their their scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, and uh, concerning Jesus. I think I'll read the. Uh, let's go to First Peter, Romans two and Romans are good, but I'm not. I'm not trying to belabor the point. Just to read enough, so you understand what I'm trying to do by this group of verses. First uh, Peter chapter 1 and verse 10. Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Uh, both comings of Christ. The sufferings of Christ, his first coming, the glories to follow would be his ascension back to the Father and his glorious return. And it says that the prophets searched diligently. What were they searching diligently? Each other's writings. Jeremiah studied Isaiah. Daniel studied Jeremiah. He quoted Jeremiah's writings. Uh, they all studied Moses. Moses was the foundation prophet. And as I like to explain to people, say for instance, Jeremiah, yes, he was inspired to write his book. But just because he was inspired to write his book did not mean he was inspired to understand everything in Isaiah. He had to study it. He had to search diligently. He had to think about it. He had to discuss it. The Lord just didn't tell Jeremiah everything there is to know about the book of Isaiah. So they were all prophets and they all wrote inspired scripture, but they were also all Bible students of each other. And the main thing they were searching for is not the fall of Babylon or God's judgment on Greece or the rise of the Roman Empire. I mean, that's all involved in it. But the main thing they were studying was the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. They were, they were studying about Christ and each other's writings. Direct to your point uh, about Daniel, you said he came to the point to understand that Jeremiah had written and he now understands that the time of their captivity was over. So back to your point, he had come to that conclusion through Reading and, reading and studying, and in some cases, an angel had to come and reveal it to him. So, you know, a great godly man like Daniel was trying to figure out what Jeremiah was talking about. So it wasn't just automatic illumination uh, of the other prophets' writings. So, and there's others not even in this group, but that, that's more than sufficient to give you an idea of how the New Testament writers looked at the Old Testament prophets and use them 
uh, to preach about Christ. So now let's go back to Matthew chapter 3. And this handout uh, I prepared for you tonight, I'm really, I kind of explained it, but I have 29 references in Matthew, and that's not even, that's just getting to chapter 24, which, you know, the whole chapter 24 is about the end times. But uh, a lot of these, we may just say a couple of things about and go on. So my purpose is not to, you know, like preach a whole lesson on each one of these verses. But I wanted to list them because we're going to at least read them as we come to them. Uh, but to just kind of give you an idea of, of how much Jesus spoke about his return even before he died on the cross. He's constantly talking about his future kingdom, him coming back as king, ruling over the earth, defeating his enemies, uh, rescuing his people, you know, all these kind of things. And yet he hadn't even been arrested and nailed to the cross yet and resurrected. But he's, he's looking out there to the distant future. So it's, just, it's the, the 29 references is partly to show the importance of eschatology, even in his first coming. But this is the first uh, place where an Old Testament prophecy is referenced when the wise men were coming to uh, try to find the Messiah. They'd been revealed to them. They'd been led by what was called a star. They came to King Herod. They were trying to figure out exactly where, where they might go. Uh, and then in verse 4, when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. This verse is interesting to me because this is the first time this group of people is said to gather together for the purpose of talking about Christ in some way. Because they gathered together quite a few times during his ministry to try to figure out how to get rid of it. And they gathered together quite a few times in the early chapters of Acts, like with Peter and John, uh, to try to intimidate them to stop preaching. So this is just, it's just interesting to me. It's the kind of the first description of them coming together to inquire about Christ. And, but they gave the right answer. They said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophets, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who, shall, who will shepherd my people Israel. Now, you may have a center column reference or something that says that's a quote from Micah 5, 2. But when we go back to Micah and read verse 2 and we read, the verse before it, a few verses after it, we realize it's like that passage we looked at last time uh, that talks about both comings and gives a lot of details about both. The one in Hosea chapter 5, verse 14 through chapter 6, verse 3. So let's go back to Micah. And this is one of those... I call sweeping passages with quite a bit of detail about both comings of, uh, of Christ. So Micah 5, verse 1. Verse 2, of course, is the one quoted in Matthew. But we need to pick up a few thoughts in, in, uh, in verse 1. Now gather yourself in troops, O daughter of troops. He has laid siege against us. They will strike the judge of Israel with a rod on the cheek. Now, if you have a mindset, like I often tell Liberty here, if you have a mindset when you're reading the Old Testament, always look for Christ. Always have that mindset of, is Christ in this passage? So, for instance, this ver we know verse 2 is about Christ, so it's not taking a leap to think that the verse leading up to it might have something to do with Christ. Uh, and when it says they will strike the judge of Israel with a rod on the cheek. 
Uh, Micah prophesied about the same time as Isaiah. So they may have known each other, shared information with each other. They used a fair amount of common language in each other's books. So this statement, they shall strike the judge of Israel with the rod on the cheek. So keep your finger here. Go to Isaiah 53 real quick, that famous chapter about the suffering servant. We all love to preach sermons from Isaiah 53. But it says in verse 4, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. That word smitten by God is exactly the same Hebrew word that Micah uses, strike the judge, or smite the judge would be just as correct. Smitten by God in Isaiah, but Micah looks at the other side of the coin. They shall strike the judge. Who is they? The Jews and the Romans. So humans are going to strike the judge, but in that same event, he is smitten by God. So it, it brings up a real important truth that the apostles in the book of Acts often bring up, and we'll look at a verse in about this in Acts chapter 2, if you turn over there real quick. Acts chapter 2, in verse 23. Him, being Christ, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. So there's smitten by God of Isaiah 53, 4. Why did Christ die? He was smitten by God. God judged our sins by placing our sins on him and smote him. So it was the will and purpose of God for his son to die. But it, this verse goes on to say, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. So they were guilty of murder at the same time, God was smiting his son. So that's what Micah is, Micah is emphasizing the murder of humans. They murdered Christ. Isaiah is emphasizing the smitten by God part of it. That, that the father was sacrificing his son. And, and both happened at the same time, side by side. God was involved in the death of his son. Humans were involved. So they were still guilty, even though God was sacrificing his son. I, I think that this is beautiful kind of truth. And so in verse 2, of course, of Michael 5, is the, the one quoted. By the way, if you want to write down Mark 15, 19, Mark's description of the crucifixion of Christ is the verse that fulfills Micah 5.1. They, uh, they shall strike the judge of Israel with a rod on the cheek. Mark 15.19 says they beat him with, Mark calls it reeds, but it's the same as rods. They beat him on the head across the face with rods. Micah had prophesied that detail of his suffering hundreds of years before it actually happened. So the judge of Israel is Christ, and the people are going to strike him with a rod on the cheek. I mean, it's such detail. How, how, could you, how could you predict that kind of detail hundreds of years ahead of time? And then the place where he was born is Bethlehem. Ephrathah is the region. Bethlehem is the house of bread. So the bread of life was born in the house of bread. Just those kind of little details that makes the Bible interesting. Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. 
Well, he's actually going to be a literal ruler in Israel at his second coming. He was guaranteed or made possible by his death and resurrection, but it comes to pass in his second coming in, in the, the fullest sense. The one to be ruler in Israel. So that's distant future, but now distant past, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. So that's the uh, eternality of Christ, we would call it. The divinity of Christ is involved in it. He didn't, what Micah, what God is saying through Micah in verse 2 is that, yes, he is going to be born in Bethlehem, but that's not his start. His start was from of old, from everlasting. He became a human, born a baby in Bethlehem, but his beginning had no beginning. So, it's, you know, Micah's trying to re really make this point that the Messiah does not have a start in Bethlehem. That's just when he becomes manifested as a human. Therefore, he shall give them up, verse 3 says. Why? Because they strike the judge of Israel with a rod on the cheek, in verse 1. Because of what they did to him, he gives them up. That's Matthew 23 and 38. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. He gave them up because they rejected him as Messiah. And one of the famous untils of the Bible, if you, if you mark in your Bible, you circle words or anything, highlight in any way, Whenever you come across the word until, circle it, highlight it, do something so that you easily see it because the untils and the tills, same, same word, same meaning, of the Bible are very, very important, uh, especially in prophecy. Anytime you see the word until, it usually carries the idea that something is stopping or pausing uh, and then a gap of time, short or usually long. And then it's going to pick up again and continue from there. So he's going to give them up. That happened just before his death. And how long is it going to be in place? Until the time that she who is in labor has given birth. Is that Mary giving birth to Jesus? Or is that Jesus giving birth to the nation of Israel at his return? Or both? Again, Micah and Isaiah were contemporaries and they used similar language. And he's talking about he's going to give the nation up and it really can't be Mary giving birth to Jesus because Jesus had been born years before he gave them up. So I was talking about some kind of birth after he gives them up. So keep your finger here and go to Isaiah 66, where it talks about two births. Isaiah 66 And verse 7. It's a really interesting language here. Before she travailed, she gave birth. How do you give birth before the labor pain? So he's not just talking about Mary giving birth to Jesus. He's talking about Israel giving birth to Jesus. He was born from Israel. And, but before she had labor, uh, before her pain came, it says, she delivered a male child. Who has heard such a thing? I mean, that goes against nature, doesn't it? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? So now it's talking about the earth giving birth in one day. 
for shall a nation be born at once. So here's a second kind of birth happening. The first birth was the male child, Jesus. And then the corporate son, I like to call it, being born at a later time. For as soon as Zion travailed, now here's the birth after the travail. She gave birth to her children. That's when a nation is born in one day. And Israel as a nation will be born in one day at the return of Christ. So there's two births, the birth of the personal son, Jesus, and the corporate son, Israel. And the church will be involved in that in, in some ways we'll talk about later. So back to Micah 5, until the time that she who is in labor has given birth, then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel, and he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. So that's his return, when he's going to be the shepherd of his people, he's going to be the king of the earth. And they shall abide, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. Many verses talk about this, Zechariah, many in Zechariah, many in uh, Isaiah. Now that Christ will be the great king over all the earth. Uh, and then it says, and this one shall be peace. Well, he brought peace at his first coming, didn't he? You can have peace in your heart. You can be reconciled to God through the death of Christ. But he's going to bring peace to the whole earth at his return. The Prince of Peace, he's called in Isaiah. Again, Isaiah and Micah using similar language. And this one shall be peace. When is that going to happen? When the Assyrian comes into our land. Uh, the Assyrian is one of the kind of uh, veiled or vi not vague, uh, one of the uh, ways to describe the final Antichrist. Assyria was the empire of, of this day. Therefore, they were the Antichrist of that day, the Antichrist spirit. And then later, Babylon was the Antichrist spirit. Then Greece, and Medes and Persians, and Rome, they took on that Antichrist spirit of persecuting God's people and, and just being generally wicked. When the Assyrian comes into our land, and when he treads our palaces, then we will raise against him seven shepherds and eight princely men. They shall waste with the sword the land of Assyria, the land of Nimrod. Nimrod, back in Genesis, is the, one of the very first types of Antichrist. He certainly had the spirit of Antichrist at his entrances. Then he shall deliver us. He who? Well, the end of verse 4, he shall be great to the ends of the earth the judge of Israel in verse 1. He shall deliver us from the Assyrian when he comes into our land, when he treads within our borders. I do want to read one verse to, sh to, to maybe help you see I'm not making too much of it when I say the Assyrian is one of the descriptive names of the Antichrist. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38, Really interesting verse. Just kind of says it in passing. But as much as uh, the Old Testament speaks about Christ in multitudes of verses, it also speaks about the Antichrist far more often than we realize. Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38, and in this chapter, Gog is the Antichrist, Gog of Magog, one of the names of the Antichrist. Gog simply means chief prince, the head prince of this uh, evil 
uh, military force. Verse 16, uh, you will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land, Gog will, the Antichrist will. It will be in the latter days, so that lets us know it's down there at the end, that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am hallowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes. Thus says the Lord God, here's the verses to me really interesting. Are you he of whom I have spoken in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel? who prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them. Now you take that verse 17 and you try to do a Bible study where the prophets talk about the Antichrist coming against Israel and the Lord stepping in to be hallowed when he destroys the Antichrist. Uh, it, it, it's not really said very much directly, but it's scattered all through the Old Testament more than you think. And this verse clearly says that somehow those prophets spoke about this man all the way through and that I would cause him to come against Israel in the latter days. That's a real fascinating prophecy, I think. So let's, let's finish up Micah and then maybe say it just a few more things before we close. If you can find Jonah, you can find your way back to Micah. I didn't want to go there. I wanted to go back to where we started with in this, Matthew chapter 2, where he closes out this quote from Micah 5, 2, for, you, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And we think of all those great passages like the 23rd Psalm. You know, the Lord is my shepherd. Jesus in John 10, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Um, he's going to be a good shepherd. Uh, Ezekiel talks a lot about the evil shepherds who did a lot of damage to God's people. Christ is going to come back as the good shepherd and feed his people, Israel. I want to point something out. Let's move on to the second one on the list. You see it's a Well, I didn't even put it on the list. I already made a mistake on, these, on, on the list. I wanted to look real quickly at chapter 2, verse 11. This is, again, this is one of those details that's just so beautiful to me. Uh, but you can miss it. Uh, and when they had come into the house, the wise men, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And we often say that the, the, the gold is the a gift for a king, uh, the frankincense is a uh, gift of a high priest. They would use the incense, frankincense, in their uh, offerings. And then, of course, myrrh was not only used that way also, but myrrh was real commonly used in uh, as an ointment for injuries and also used for dead bodies, uh, as an ointment for a dead body, and used in embalming. So the myrrh aspect speaks about his death and the gold of him being king and the frankincense of him being uh, the high priest. But keep your finger here and go to Isaiah chapter 60. In this whole chapter of Isaiah 60, is speaking about his return. Isaiah 50, 60 and verse 6. The multitude of camels shall cover your land. The dromedaries of Midian and Ephah and all those from Sheba shall come. 
They shall bring gold and incense. They shall proclaim the praises of the Lord. And uh, you notice something very interesting. They bring gold and incense, frankincense, but they don't bring myrrh. That's because he's still the king represented by the gold, and he's still the high priest represented by the incense, but he only died once. There's no reason to bring myrrh after he returns. His suffering, his death, his being a, a, a Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus made the spices and ointments when they buried the body of Jesus. And no doubt myrrh was involved in that. But in his return, he won't need myrrh any longer, will he? And so that's just one of those little details where you compare two verses, one from the New Testament, one from the Old. And uh, just one of those beautiful little details. Uh, chapter 3 and verse 2, I better have included that. And now I'm second-guessing myself. Uh John the Baptist comes on the scene and his message is, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we're going to talk about that at hand. Uh, it's also used in chapter 4, verse 17 by Jesus. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I listed a whole group of Old Testament verses and uh, in both of these, in Matthew, the kingdom is a central subject, certainly by Christ. He's the king. Why wouldn't he talk about his kingdom? Uh, it was the primary message of John the Baptist. All of Israel looked for the king to come and set up his kingdom. The problem was they, they only looked at the part where he would defeat their enemies and set them up as the head nation. And, and they would be the leading nation of this kingdom and their Messiah would be their king and they'd be over all the other nations. And that might be a part of, of all that subject. But that was all of that subject to them. They dwelt on that part of it so much. And that's why John and Jesus came along and said, you're looking forward to the Messiah coming to be the king and set up his kingdom? Yeah, yeah, we are. You better repent first. You're not going to be part of it. You're not going to see it. You're not going to inherit it. You're not going to enjoy it. You're not going to play a role in it because you need to repent. If you truly repent, then you might have a chance. If you don't repent, what you claim to be looking for, you're going to miss. So, in these early verses in Matthew, anytime the subject of the kingdom is brought up, which to Israel is like the most important subject, it's almost always preceded by repent because they were not ready for their king. They were not ready for his kingdom. They needed a change of heart. At one time in uh, the Gospel of John, it says that they came and tried to take him by force, John chapter 6, and make him king. And he refused. At his triumphal entry, they said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That was reserved for their Messiah, their king. He was coming in and they were ready to receive him as king. The first thing he did when he got inside the walls of Jerusalem is he began to weep. And that's when he said in Matthew 23, if you had only known, he said in Luke's account of it, you did not know the time of your visitation. You really didn't know what my visit was all about. And because you didn't repent, I'm going to take the kingdom from you. This is Matthew 21, 43. I'm going to take the kingdom from you and give it to another nation bearing the fruit of it. So the question is a lot of times the uh, teaching of imminence that the Lord could return at any minute, any moment, 
and not violate uh, one prophecy. So is the use of at hand, does it also imply imminence? Uh, one thing we'll look at, and uh, my alarm just went off and I don't want to hold you past time. Uh, we're going to start next time looking at those Old Testament verses. And it's surprising how many times in the Old Testament, hundreds of years before the first coming of Christ, is talking about the future at hand. The same events that the New Testament is talking about at hand, the Old Testament talks about as at hand, and yet they were way out there in the future. And somehow we have to reconcile that language. So we'll we'll try to do that next time. I don't want to I don't want to give it a short time because it's, it's too important. And a lot of these verses, uh, after we get through uh, talking about at hand. Uh, only have kind of an indirect reference maybe to the end times. So we'll just kind of read them and make a couple of comments and move on. Because uh, I know we're really interested in like Matthew 24, 2 Thessalonians 2, Book of Revelation, Daniel, things like that. And, and we're going to be uh, mixing all those in and focusing on those chapters when we get to them. But it's really important to really understand Matthew 24. You need to kind of understand some things about the verses leading up to it that speak about the end times to give context to it and, and really get you prepared for it. Uh, a lot of times, the I call it a mistake because I this is my approach in the past. Okay, we're going to study Matthew 24. Turn to Matthew 24, verse 1. And we're, we're kind of like separating it from all that came before it in Matthew, building up to it. That gives us kind of like a flavor, gives us a, a frame of mind, uh, makes us familiar with terminology uh, that Jesus uses in Matthew 24. So we're going to take some time to build up to Matthew 24 and, and then... Uh, once we get through Matthew, Mark and Luke will go quick because most of what's in Mark and Luke about the end times is dealt with in Matthew. So we don't need to repeat it. And not that many in John and, and Acts. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll move through a lot of this fairly quickly, but there's a lot in the whole New Testament about the end times. So we're not going to... Uh, we're going to do our best not to skip any verse that has something to do with the end times, even if we just briefly read it and mention it. Uh, because what we're trying to do is, is put all thousand pieces of the thousand piece puzzle together. Not just the Matthew 24 pieces or the Second Thessalonians 2 pieces, so we want all the pieces so when we get through, we have like a complete picture of the whole subject. Okay, so that's enough of my part. Comments, questions, anybody? <clears throat> yes. Fascinating study to think about uh, God being in charge of empires and rulers at times and fullness of times. And in the book of Daniel, the ch second chapter, Atheists and seconds have the hardest time with Daniel to any of the chapters in the Bible. How that Daniel can so precisely prophesy uh, the course of human events, prophesizing his image about the head of gold being Babylon, and then the Medes and Persians, and then the Greeks, centuries before the Greeks were mm -hmm. of The Roman Empire, and at the bottom of the uh, statue, he's got the feet. And the toes, ten toes of, of clay and iron that don't mix. And that's, of course, still uh, coming to be. So as you look at the prophecies, prophecies of Daniel and how they all came true and how God has ways of moving things around. And look at Isaiah 66. It's always just been such a fascinating verse to me about shall the earth be made to bring forth one day. Shall nation be born at once? The earth, and of course, think of 
you know, the United Nations. And how that happened? Well, World War I started, and hardly anyone can tell you why it was even started. Mm -hmm. But it was started through a weird set of things that sparked and inflagration started. And then after that, Germany was just devastated and they made the scapegoats and brought the rise of Adolf Hitler. And Adolf Hitler, for some reason, took off on the Jews and started the Holocaust. And so we have the end of World War II, and we discovered what happened to the Jews. And one of the great prophecies of the Bible about the nation being, born, being brought forth in one day by the earth. How that happened World War II, and I find this interesting caveat of that time period. The Jews are put on boats, and the Americas, America didn't want to take them. They are rolling around, and so the United Nations, the earth, thought we have a problem. Well, we'll just create Israel after, after 2,000 years. So even the creation in 1948, after not being a nation for 2,000 years, how it was miraculously created, even from a nation of America who liberated the concentration camps, wouldn't even take them in. If we would have taken them in, there probably would have been no need to have a nation in them. But God had to have his nation Israel back. So therefore, he touched the hearts even of the Americans after World War II so that the world would create Israel. Yeah, I see that Isaiah 66, 8 is another one of those uh, that are so often in the Bible, <laughs> dual fulfillment. In other words, they were born in one day physically as a nation in 1948 as a necessary precursor so that they could be a nation in their land when Jesus comes back so that they could be born spiritually in one day. So they're going to have they had a physical birth as a nation, but they still, that can't be all of it because the Lord is all about spiritual birth as well. He doesn't want them to become a physical nation without a spiritual change. And that will happen one day in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, the whole nation. Zechariah 12, verse 10, 11 says, They shall look on him whom they pierced, and they shall weep. And they will repent, and they will be saved in one day. Uh, so 1948 was a necessary precursor to the spiritual birth. So two, two ideas of birth in one verse. Pretty interesting. Any questions, comments, anybody? Do you find that, uh, like, the timeline in terms of, uh, like, the old set, like, when, uh, with Daniel, when he's talking about, it's like, they keep going back to the, the day, the last, like, talked about last week, the 1260, the 1290, the 1335. So I'm kind of just like Google searching on my phone and you know, I was like finding my timelines and stuff like that. And I, I, I haven't like fact checked some of this stuff, but I found it kind of interesting with what I have read. Uh, but starting with Joseph with the uh, worldwide seven year famine uh, from eight, uh, 1878 to 1871 BC. And then 1260 years from that time was the fall of Assyria. And then 30 years later, which would be 1,291 years since that seven-year famine was the fall of Israel in 722 BC. And then at 1,335 years from the seven-year famine is the fall of Judah. And also when Daniel got his vision. So I find it kind of interesting if that adds up for those years to also be days when it's speaking prophetically about the end. Yeah, that's what you read. It's called the day-year theory or approach, where those days are not days, they're actually years. And there may be some kind of application to that, but uh, the 1260 days in Daniel in 1290 and 1335, Revelation takes those up and it uses 1260 days, but in a few verses also uses 42 months. It's kind of like God's way of saying, whatever application they may be as years, they are literal days, 42 months, time, times, and half a time. So that, that uh, seven year period, especially the last three and a half year period, is 1260 days, like we think of days.
But again, there's so many things in the Bible have like dual applications. Yeah, they use the same numbers over and over and over. Yeah, but like, when, when God uses three different terms to describe the same period, 1260, 42 months, time times half a time, it's almost like he's saying, I want to use different terms so that you understand it's days, 1260 days. Is something important is going to happen within that period of time. Appreciate the comments about uh, how to approach this and not uh, <coughs> violate any scriptures. And, you know, I was just simply talking to a, a customer the other day that we wanted to talk about the end times. So he has some views that I've never heard before that are really, really fun. And I asked him just simple that simple that question. How can you reconcile that with scripture? He went off the my God and then he made a statement. That's just that's, that's craziness. It has to be based upon the word of God and not Bible scripture. And so he, after he after he did that, he uh, I said, Well what do you do with and I threw out a couple of scriptures. He said, Well, I I don't move this. But they get they go back to my God. Uh-huh. In a sense, that's that God does not violate his word, it's true, it's accurate, and our interpretation may be incorrect too many times. But he's not gonna violate it. So I, my point being I appreciate that methodically we're going through in such a way that when we come to some conclusions it's not fragmented, that uh, it should be can be solved in our minds. So I'm, I'm doing this approach as much for my own benefit as, as anything because I don't trust my own biases. And if you just, the usual way of teaching the end times, is, you know, just jump into Matthew 24 and you already have your conclusions made and you're trying to kind of force it into that. But if, if you just try to go through and look at every verse, you're more likely to come to conclusions not based on your own prejudices, but simply putting all the information together as best you can. So I hope we can accomplish that. So Lorenzo, that, that, that's, do I have the name correct? Yes, you do. Well, thank you for coming out tonight. And uh, I understand recently Lost your mother. Our condolences. Thank you. Uh, good to have you tonight. May we have your name? My name is Angie. Angie. Oh, okay. <laughs> good to have you tonight, Angie. We're trying our best to uh, attract <laughs> others from the community, even others of different churches, just to gather together and study about the end time. So come back and be with us. Join the discussion as, as you wish. Anything else tonight? I have one more question that's off the top of the baby. So, obviously, I, my wife just lost her, her death, right? I don't know if we can have this up. So I go for it. And it's still on my mind for the last couple of days since I talked to my wife. She kind of gave me like the play by play on how it unfolded at the end. So it's just, my mind's been kind of on it. So it kind of ties in, it's kind of in terms of the uh, resurrection. So with your theory, because I've read two different passages of scriptures that just racked in my brain in terms of when you're, when you pass away, are you asleep? And so I read, I read verses about Lazarus, or Lazarus and, you know, the rich man. And, you know, he, he's in torment and Hades and he looks up and he sees Lazarus and Abraham's bosom and they call the flies up to distract his feet or stick it in water and put it on the tongue. So it's like, well, it makes me think, okay, then when you pass away, you know, you already are at some place based on reading verses like that. But then there's other verses I'm reading about here's the sleep and like kind of like time does not apply to you until Jesus comes back and then he's going to gather and gather everyone right the dead will rise. So I was wondering what your thought was in terms of when someone does pass away. And she kind of gave me some really vivid description of watching her dad die as he was like, he was calling out to his mom mm-hmm. at his last moments. And his mom's passed away since the 80s. And so 
part of me thinks maybe it's a psychological thing. You're, you're, you're kind of going back to childhood and you see your mom in the kitchen or something. That's like the it's a physiological, you know, psychological uh, response. Or do you actually have a vision of seeing your mom as you're passing away? And then he, he, and he was laying in bed the entire time. And at the last moment, he got this like spark of energy to where the body sat up directly in bed. And his eyes opened wide and gasped up like he was looking up in the sky. And yet he had been in a really, uh, you know, just laying in bed, you know, calm touch or whatever. So it just, it makes, it's made it thrive in my brain as to when you do pass away and you're waiting for Jesus to come and for the resurrection, are you just asleep like it's a long dream and you wake up like it's nothing? Or are you someplace for a while? So I'm kind of confused. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, when, when the Bible talks about a saint passing away, it often uses the term sleep or rest. Not so much, I don't think, like we think of sleep as that we're not aware of it. We do know we are aware of it. Our brain is working all through our sleep. We're dreaming. Uh, we figure out problems in our sleep. Our subconscious is still active. So even when we're asleep, we're not as unaware as we think. So I don't think we should press that so much to say, since it uses the word sleep, that means we're unaware of anything. Uh, there are, use one example of the rich man of Lazarus. Revelation talks about there are souls under the altar asking the Lord, how long do you avenge our blood? Well, are they awake or not? Well, obviously they are. They're praying in heaven, you know. Uh, so the, the, the main thing is the Bible doesn't, the way I like to explain it all is that God created us to have a body. And so that from the time we die until the resurrection, the Bible doesn't say a whole lot about that, in, what we call the intermediate state. Mostly how it describes the intermediate state are souls in heaven waiting for their glorified bodies because God wants us to be restored to a perfect body for our perfect spirit. But we are a spirit and that spirit is alive. And Paul said to depart from the body is to be present with the Lord. So we are present with him in a spirit but just not a physical body. And so I would say that uh, we have awareness. Now, to what degree or what we're doing, the Bible really doesn't say a whole lot other than, I guess, we're probably praising the Lord and you know, enjoying his fellowship. And how can rich man already be in peace if he hasn't been judged? He already what? Uh, we're... <clears throat> I should answer that. The Bible says we are already condemned. And the only way we escape that condemnation is through being born again, being saved. Uh, and that's how we escape. So everyone's headed toward that same place as the rich man from just how we are naturally. The only way we can change that is through a spiritual birth. So it's not like you have to wait for some future judgment to know whether you're going to heaven or hell. That's determined in this life. But there are other things that might be determined in a future judgment. We talk about rewards and positions and things like that. But as far as our uh, destiny of our spirit, when we die, that's settled in this life. Good questions, which you were asking good questions when you were two years old, so well, I don't expect anything else. I told that to the Lord. I, I was asking about the Antichrist and my dad about the pocket night. And now my daughter's doing it to me. And I don't turn her away because I, I know it's time to help with this. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word that we're simply just trying to understand, and we ask for your help to know the truth, even if it causes us to change our present opinions and views. We want to align ourselves with your word. Thank you for each one who is here tonight. I pray your blessings on each one. I pray that you will forgive us our sins and increase our faith. In Jesus' name, amen.
Yes, I need to stop this.